Ninth Story Studios, giving story a voice. Welcome to the lift. Get ready to take a ride. <laughs> Twitter and tweet. Come find us on Twitter at Victoria's Lift. Tweet tweet. Hello, and welcome to season four, episode thirteen of Victoria's Lift. I'm Daniel Foytek, and I thank you for listening. Today's episode is part three of three and concludes our first multi-episode story, which was written by me and edited by my dear friend, Cynthia Lohman. Without her help, this story would not have come together as it has. Bringing the story to life are Graham Rowett, Francesca Moe, Pierce O'Byrne, the aforementioned Cynthia Lohman, me playing Tom, a character created by Scarlett Algy, who has appeared in multiple episodes of The Lift, and of course, Amber Collins as our girl Victoria. Our tale is accompanied by a custom score written by our resident composer, Nico Viteze of We Talk of Dreams, and artwork by Jeanette Andromeda. I'm excited to have you along for this ride with Victoria in what will be this season's finale. 2021 will begin a new chapter of Victoria's ongoing adventures, bringing back some recurring characters, two of which appear in today's episode, and reveal more about Victoria, her history, and dive into some deeper overarching plots. We're also excited to announce that Christopher Long, the very talented author who wrote Season 4, Episode 1, Half the Mirage's Mirror, is writing a special Patreon-exclusive series starring Victoria called To Those Who Thrive in the Dark. This series will feature multiple challenging foes for Victoria to overcome and is deeply based on lore and legend. The series will be available to supporters at the $5 a month and above level and will be released later this spring. For the main show, for Season 5, we've mapped out an exciting storyline with regular monthly episodes starting later this spring. And while we're in production for the next few months, we do have some fun things planned for all of you, including some behind-the-scenes discussions and even a couple of flash fiction tales to keep you entertained. As always, before we get started today, a big thank you to those who are supporting the show. Without you, this show would not be possible. It's your support that's going to allow us to expand the world next season and provide you with extra story content. On behalf of our authors and everyone else involved in making the show, a sincere thank you for your support of this show and of independent horror fiction. If you're not already supporting the show, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash Victoria's Lift. Thank you to those who took the time to rate us five stars and write a short review for us on iTunes. Your ratings do help others find the show, and we love hearing from you. In fact, here's Victoria, who has begun reading some of her favorite reviews on the show. Hello there, it's Victoria. I just wanted to say thank you to those of you who have taken the time to rate the stories five stars and write a short review. So today, I thought I'd take a moment to read a couple of those for you, as my way of saying thank you. <clears throat> From Kitty Pajamas in the United States. A nice five-star review. Must listen. Started listening to this after finding the Wicked Library. Let's just say I'm obsessed. Fantastic narration and wonderfully strange stories from our favorite creepy little girl. Well, thank you for that. I'm obsessed with your review. From Flubber to Cool in the United Kingdom. This is amazing. The main character in this is Victoria. She is the one who runs a lift. While she is childlike, she is not childish. <laughs> no, I really am not. You get glimpses of her past, but not all is revealed, so she is still a mystery, which is nice. Oh, I'll always be a mystery, dear Flubber. I like the fact that you don't know how these stories are going to end. Not all bad, not all good. I also like the fact that the writers will sometimes use either real-life characters or set their stories in eras that are a real part of history. It adds something to the stories. The writers mix up with modern day as well, which is good too. Even though the stories are written by various writers, the standard is very good. While I would say if you want real in-your-face horror all the time, this probably isn't for you. No, that's more of my uncle's thing over at the Wicked Library. 
very scary. However, if you want something intriguing, mind-bending, and challenging, then this might just be for you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that lovely review, and I think you're amazing too. Keep your reviews coming, and you might just hear me read them on the show. Now, let's go for a ride. I have lost so much. My name is Victoria. I am bound to this place, charged with guiding those who must choose. Don't be afraid. I can never again be the little girl I was. Will you accept your fate or change it? I have my music box and a library lost, but I sometimes feel very alone. Won't you join me? It's time for your ride on the lift. <laughs> Don't be afraid. I'm afraid you're too dangerous to be allowed to remain together. No, no, I refuse to let you take her from me. You may think you won. But you haven't. The piper managed to wrestle control away from the girl in that final moment and play nine notes. But nine notes were enough. The flute flew apart, exploding in every direction and tossing Victoria head over heels into the bars of her cage. Four years later. September 24th, 1989. The diner buzzed with early Sunday morning energy. Special Agent Jackie Ellis sat with her friend Tom Riley in a booth along the back wall, watching the entrance. She looked at her wristwatch and sighed. <sighs> They'll be here. It's almost 11 o'clock. They'll be here. Are you sure the information is good? It's always been good. You sure you can trust what's-her-name? Renee. Yeah, I'm sure. She's the one that had the trouble with that boxer. Jackie, you know for this arrangement of ours to work, there are things you don't want me to talk about. <sighs> right. So she's been gone for four years. Why all of a sudden does she show up now? I doubt it was by her choice. You know time isn't always the same for her as it is for us. It might have been a few days, a month, or even... Or four years. Or four years, Yeah. Probably has been four years. I don't know. Maybe he's been good at moving him around. We've had everyone looking. And I mean everyone. There are a lot of you, aren't there? You know better than anyone there are. And we'd do anything for her. And we're sure it's her. Renee is. They come here every other Sunday. He orders corned beef and hash. And she gets blueberry pancakes. There is... One weird thing, though. Or so Renee says. What? It's... It, it, it doesn't make sense. N not with what I know about how long she's been in the building. Never mind. We'll see when they come in. Don't play me like that, Tom. If you know something... You two want more coffee. Perfect timing. I was just thinking about a refill. I'll bet you were. Are you, miss? Yeah, do it. The coffee's really good here. We do our best. You're sure you two don't want to order anything? People love our blueberry pancakes. So I've heard. Tom and Jackie looked up and watched the girl make her way to the coat rack. She removed her bright yellow jacket to reveal a faded and worn lilac sweater and hung her jacket on a hook. As the girl turned back to take a seat at a table near the window, they got a good look at her. She was in her early teens and wore her curly blonde hair in a short bob. Her pink sunrise capri were faded, and one knee was worn through. Oh. My. God. That... That can't be her. Yeah. See, that's what Renee told me. I guess it makes sense. What? How old does she look to you? Thirteen. Fourteen, maybe. 
But that's not possible, is it? I mean, it can't be her. She's always been the same. If she was gone for four years, and she's been outside of the building... This can't be right. The bell rang again, and an older man in his 70s wearing large, dark-rimmed glasses entered. He skipped the coat rack and kept his tweed coat and Irish flat cap as he joined the girl at her table, who was already excitedly putting in her order with the waitress. It's him. How can you tell? I just can. We need to separate them so we can talk to her. We need to be sure. You brought it? What do you think's in this bag? Uh, Take it easy. I just wanted to be sure. She's looking at us. Maybe that's a good sign. Now he's looking at us. You've been staring. Maybe they think you're a creep. Maybe he thinks you're a cop. Please. I don't give off cop vibes. I know how to be discreet. (laughs) Oh, you're funny. You totally give off cop vibes. People will know for sure when I shoot your ass. The man stood and walked in their direction. He's coming. Just play it cool. The man slowed as he approached and stopped at their booth. He looked intently at Tom, then Jackie. Well, hello there, sir, miss, and what a fine day it is indeed. (laughs) The man tipped his hat at each of them in turn and then walked on. Okay, so where's he going? Men's room. Let's do this. Right. The two made their way to the booth, where the young blonde girl sat arranging syrup and napkins as she waited for her meal. She looked up as they approached. Hi there. Hello. I saw you looking at us. May I help you? I'm Jackie Ellis with the FBI. We're trying to find a lost girl, and we were hoping you might be able to help us. Is it okay if we ask you a few questions? May I see your badge? (laughs) Sure. Here you go. Hmm. Looks real. And I assume that your friend here is not with the FBI, since neither of you identified him as such. Smart kid. No, I'm not FBI. I'm just a concerned citizen. Helping out. I guess you'd call me a, um, consultant. The girl considered Tom, blinking a few times and looking him over. I'd say that's not entirely accurate, but you seem to be okay. Do I, um, do I look familiar to you at all? No. Should you? You just remind me of someone. I might be mistaken. Perhaps. So, you come to this diner pretty often? Of course. My pop-pop brings me here for pancakes all the time. I hear they're pretty good. Oh, indeed they are. Blueberry is my favorite, with lots of maple syrup and loads of butter. Well, that sounds good. It is. So, your pop-pop? Yes. You live with him? That's right. Have you lived with him long? Um, a while, I guess. Uh Uh-huh. And I hate to ask this, honey, but what happened to your parents? Oh, I don't have any. Did they pass away? No. But you said you don't have parents. That's right. My pop-pop takes care of me. And is he your mom's dad or your dad's dad? Neither. He's just my pop-pop. But honey, you must have had parents at some point. No. I don't think so. I live with my pop-pop. Here you are, honey. Your blueberry stack. Extra blueberries for my favorite girl. Oh my, they look wonderful. You enjoy, Vicky. Oh, I intend to. And you too. You sure no pancakes for you? No. Thank you, though. Excuse us for a minute, Vic- Vicky. Mm-hmm. Tom and Jackie took a few steps away from the girl as she dug into the plate with great gusto. It's her. I agree. How do you want to do this? Are you carrying Do you really want me to answer that? Good. You go to the men's room and see what happened to Pop Pop. I'll give her the box. Got it. And Tom. Yeah? You know he can't get near the box. I know. If you have to, you do what you need to do. Right. Tom's laid-back attitude fell away. He straightened to his full height 
and adjusted his jacket, then moved with purpose toward the rear of the restaurant. Jackie watched him disappear around the corner, then returned to the table and slid into the chair across from the girl. So, the pancake's good? Mmm, mm-hmm, really good. That's good. I'd like to have you take a look at something for me, okay? Mm-hmm. Jackie pulled a small wooden box out of a brown leather satchel and pushed it across the table toward the girl. So this. This is something that belonged to our missing girl. It's very special. It's very pretty. Yes. <laughs> very old, too. It has a strange design on the top. That's called Yggdrasil. It's a special tree. And the little owl here. Is that a clasp? Yes, it's a music box. May I open it? Absolutely. In fact, I bet it will play a special song for you. The girl reached for the box as Tom returned to the table. He's gone. There was a door leading out to the alley right next to the men's. I knew something was up when he said hello to us. He made us and took off. The girl opened the box, and it played. She watched the gears inside spin and sparkle. Then she closed the lid and looked at Tom. Tommy, Tommy boy, Tommykins, tomato. Hey, sweetheart. How long? Four years. Oh. Oh. Hey, it's okay. <laughs> Come here. I've got you. Victoria felt ridiculous as she tried on yet another dress. She looked at her arms jutting out at least nine inches from the end of the sleeves. None of these are going to fit me. I'm going to need a whole new wardrobe. That one seems like it fits better than the first one. But they're all the same size. She examined herself in the mirror. Jackie was right. This one did seem to be larger than the first one she tried on. She tilted her head and looked at her hair. What was this morning a curly bob that barely reached her chin was now brushing her shoulders. Now that she was back in the building, she was reverting to her prior state and appearance. <sighs> I thought this might happen. How do you feel about that? I've been perpetually nine years old for nearly a millennium now. Well, at least from my perspective, that is. Although, I'd be fibbing if I didn't say I enjoyed having a chance to be a normal girl for a little while. The last time that happened was an exceptionally long time ago. The last time? It's a long story. It was a gift from my friend Josh. <sighs> but it only lasted a single night. Oh, really? A gift from a boy, you say? It was all very proper, I assure you. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Come, there's much to be done. They exited her bedroom, with Victoria leading the way, then made their way down the hallway, which always seemed much longer to Jackie than it should have been, until they came to her lift where Tom waited with a thick file under his arm. Are you sure you want to wear that? This is what I always wear. It's a little small. That would change the longer I'm with my music box and in the building again. This dress already feels a little looser. Besides, I need to know what's been happening while I was gone. I have a file ready for you. News clippings, magazine articles transcriptions from TV interviews, and more. The world is much as it was, though. Honestly, I was expecting more chaos with you gone for so long. Well, my timeline isn't exactly chronological, as you know. The effects of my time away might not be apparent for 10, 20, 30 years or even longer. Rest assured, though, at some point in the future, we're all in for a very troublesome four years. But I'm back now. And there will be hope. Victoria took the file and opened it. She looked at the first page, a transcription from an interview, and read, Maybe hate is what we need if we're going to get something done. Who talks like that? Oh, I'll be keeping an eye on this one. She closed the file and walked to her lift, and the doors immediately opened. 
The three stepped inside, and Victoria pressed the button marked nine. As the elevator moved, Victoria turned to Jackie. You seem very familiar to me. Have we met before today? Not for a lack of trying, but no. I've met you, but you haven't met me yet. Well, before today, that is. That sounds about right, but I'm sure I've seen you somewhere before. Are you sure you haven't tried to meet me before the proper time? Guilty. I tried to warn you before this all started, tried to keep you from getting trapped by that son of a bitch, but your building wasn't having it. Yes, things must happen at their appointed time, and for very good reason. It's a lesson I've had to learn myself the hard way. The lift came to a stop, and the door opened. Tom and Jackie stepped out, but Victoria remained inside. Tom looked at her with a raised eyebrow as she handed him the file. Go on, we'll meet in the library shortly. But first, I have something to take care of. May 26th, 2007. Victoria stepped from her lift into the darkness of the pet rescue shelter. It was 5 a.m., so the volunteers hadn't arrived yet. A few dogs whimpered as she walked by, but fell silent when they saw the huge shape that walked beside her. Its powerful muscles rippled under its gray fur, and the thick curls of its mane swayed as it moved. It looked every bit like the traditional statues that guarded sacred temples. I appreciate you taking on this task, Victoria told the Kamayanu, who blinked and gave a single nod in acknowledgement. Jeremy is particularly important to me. He helped me at one of my darkest moments. Saved my life, in fact. But... He made a powerful enemy in the process. It's only a matter of time until he has family of his own. I need to know they'll all be safe, and the Piper can never harm them. The food dog again blinked and nodded his huge head. Ah, here we are. The two came to a litter of tiny Shih Tzu puffs. Are you ready? The lion dog gave a single nod, and the star of Buddha on his forehead glowed. He shrank slowly becoming smaller and smaller, while his features changed as well. Finally, he was the same size, and had the same markings as the tiny pups. Victoria gathered him up and kissed his forehead, before placing him with the others. He raised his paws and wrapped them around her wrist, then snuggled down with his new litter mates to wait for Jeremy to arrive and take him home. by writing a short review of the show in iTunes and leaving me some gold stars. It helps others to find their way here too. I like gold stars. Can I have lots? Pretty please? Leave me stars and reviews at itunes.victoriaslift.com